This is a production of Cornell University. So I, the title of my talk is Giving Second Life to Long-Term Agro-Ecosystem Experiments. And oh, somebody has requested that. I guess I should enable it. All right. Um, but that's actually a fairly small piece of my talk. Uh, I should come clean and say the real reason that I'm giving my talk is, uh, let's see, sorry, my Zoom thing is in the way of my presenter notes, which makes it hard to see. There we go. Um, I gave it away because I clicked. Um, so I worked with Lori Drinkwater as a postdoc from 2019 to 2021. And during the last few months of that process, I started my new position full-time with the USDA ARS. So there's still a lot to finish from my postdoc work. And my new position happens to be remote and I have personal reasons to stay in Ithaca for the next couple of years. So Lori suggests that I seek out a courtesy faculty position in horticulture, the first step of which is to give a departmental seminar. So I signed up for one. Um, so I wanted to give you guys a little pitch about what I could offer as a courtesy faculty member in horticulture. So first of all, teaching. Uh, my alma mater, the University of Minnesota, where I did my PhD, has a really good Department of Teaching, Biology, and Learning. Um, I took a lot of classes in that department. I taught, worked as a TA for, I lost count of how many semesters because, you know, EB programs, there's not a lot of funding. Um, I've also done some guest teaching for Lori, and she's offered, offered me opportunities to um, continue guest teaching in her class. And I've also um, talked to Sarah Wright, one of the data librarians, about possibly co-teaching a class on data management for graduate students that I don't think that's going to be possible this spring, but a possibility for next spring um, if we can you know, talk to the right people and get it to work. So um, I also have a lot to offer in terms of collaborative research. There's my ongoing work in Lori's lab. I also have a lot of, um, I don't want to say loose ends, but um, additional research products from my postdoc work with lichen cover crops um, that's related to uh, Ginny Moore's work with the cover crop breeding project. So there's continued opportunities for collaboration there. And then finally, um, I can provide additional student support. So uh, I have mentored and supervised at least 16, probably more undergrads since I was a grad student. And uh, Lori's lab has two new grad students this semester, and I've been attending lab meetings and can offer some additional support there. Um, I also am currently supervising undergrads uh, through internships in the USDA, including one Cornell student, and there may be additional opportunities there. So I'm gonna go over my research outline now. So I'm gonna start by summarizing my research background and then uh, going into my current role as data manager for the DRIVES project, which I will explain what DRIVES means soon. And then um, hopefully imbue some well-won wisdom about data management from this process of integrating long-term experiments. So my uh, research background, kind of the core of it is evolutionary ecology. For my master's, I looked at um, plant-insect interactions in the prairie, um, and I was really interested in how species interactions drive evolutionary processes and vice versa and really thinking about population and community scale questions. And uh, this theme of evolutionary ecology continued into my PhD research at the University of Minnesota, where I worked with Ford Dennison on uh, legume and symbiotic nitrogen fixation. And those were more kind of abstract questions about conflicts of interest between plants and their symbiotic bacteria over how they allocate resources. Um, and it also, ended up turning into kind of a more abstract project about life history of symbiotic rhizobia, how selection in and out of the host affects traits that affect how beneficial the rhizobia are to the legumes. And it was all very abstract. I keep using that word. Uh, but for postdoc research, I stuck with symbiotic nitrogen fixation, but I stepped a little bit more into the real world of agriculture in Lori's lab and I joined to uh, work with the Cover Crop Breeding Project. That was a uh, collaboration with Lori's lab, Matt Ryan, um, some USDA 
folks, and that's still ongoing. And of course, we're still publishing stuff. The main focus was on um, hairy vetch as a model cover crop. So my work was really um, looking into the um, functional and fixation traits and trying to identify interesting trait differences that breeders could perhaps uh, select for. Um, but working with Lori has given me much more um, of a background in ecosystem ecology, specifically you know, soil, biogeochemistry, nutrient cycling, and you know the, the, the soil piece that I was missing before when I was just focusing on the plant, the microbe. And so um, I've used a lot of different approaches throughout my research career, a lot of field experiments and greenhouse experiments, and then work like you know, growth chambers with weird gas exchange measurements and lots of little wires sticking out everywhere, um, microbiology work. Uh, but a big part of my background has also just been in learning a lot about statistics, especially using Bayesian methods. And um, a big part of my PhD dissertation was uh, using mathematical modeling to help interpret experimental results and um, you know, deepen hypotheses. And uh, right now I'm really interested in the interface between process-based modeling and statistical modeling. So for example, using a process-based model to generate a null hypothesis, then testing that with a statistical model. Um, and of course, data management is part of everybody's research, but that's really the piece that got me my current gig with the USDA. So the DRIVES project, we now have a very nice logo, uh, is stands for Diverse Rotations Improve Valuable Ecosystem Services. They spent a lot of time coming up with that acronym and I think it's very, very fitting. So a little bit of the history, um, it started back in 2018 with a workshop called Corn in Context led by Matt Liebman. And they came up with some ideas about how important it is to use you know, all these long-term experiments that have relevant data sets. And so wouldn't it be great if we could put all these experiments together and just do a really big study about how cropping system diversity impacts system level performance, and yield stability, and not just look at yields, but look at the soil and, and wouldn't that be great? And then uh, they're like, hey, there's, there's a grant due in like two weeks, let's write it. And they did, and they got it. So there's a NEPA program called Networks for Synthesis Data Sharing and Management, and they managed to get some funding. They uh, hired a postdoc, which is my good friend, Ann Bybee Finley, who I'm sure many of you know, recent Cornell graduate. And we've got a really good team of people, plus some interns. And uh, it's been, I've been working with the project for about a year. And uh, actually, Ann gave a seminar about it a few months before I joined. So this will be a bit of an update if any of you saw that. So the core objectives of the DRIVE project are first to build a network of long-term cropping experiments. And by network, I really mean two things. There's the network of data, the DRIVE's database, which is really my role, but there's also the network of people. So we have bi-monthly collaborator meetings. We're just basically trying to help people who do similar things meet each other and connect and hope that stuff comes from that. And the second objective is to actually use that wonderful data resource to do some research. So we are uh, working on a paper to quantify yield stability and resilience to extreme weather as a function of rotational diversity. And what's uh, innovative about, you know, other people have done similar things, but what's really innovative about what we're doing is we're actually looking at yield at the whole rotation level, not just at the crop level. And I can say as somebody who's actually put now put that data set together, there's a reason that nobody's looked at data at yield on the whole rotation level. It's, it's a nightmare, but we're crazy. So we're doing it. Is this corn only? Or oh, good question. Yeah, it started with corn. And that was the first thing was like, okay, we're just gonna have something that every, everybody has corn, and then it's corn and something else. But now we're like, well, there's a lot of wheat and small grain systems. We'll, we'll put those in there too. And so most of our sites are corn based. It's a lot of stuff in the Midwest, but we're growing, we're adding more sites. And so we're, yeah, growing beyond corn. But uh, one of the main uh, applications for this research, uh, hopefully will be improving risk assessment for crop insurance, which I don't know a lot of the details about it now, but um, all I know is that 
the incentives for using more complex rotations are really, or rather crop insurance is an incentive against using more complex rotation because it really favors good yields now and a lot of the complexity benefits arise over time. So hopefully we can help improve those calculations. And uh, we also hope to do some research into the biophysical mechanisms of how diverse rotations influence yield and so forth. We're working on collecting for the data, the data for that. So for example, um, carbon sequestration um, and that's soil moisture data. We're working with a soil mod uh, modeler. To, we'll see, that's kind of the new part. So, um, so far we have data from 20 sites uh, throughout North America. The furthest north is up in, actually it's, it's funny, I think of it as being Canada, but it's technically Minnesota now that I look at this map. But we have some sites in Canada. We have a few sites down in Mexico that are part of the, um, the CIMIT uh, program. And uh, the requirements for joining was that there have to be at least three full rotation cycles of data. So I think the most recent experiment is like eight years and the longest is you know, like 60 years. And then there have to be at least two rotations with contrasting diversity. So there's some long-term sites where it's like, it's all corn and soybean, but we're only looking at tillage. It's like, that's great, but it's not for us. Um, so drives is not the only data networking effort out there. We have a lot of uh, connections with other networks that are happening. And uh, we started out um, planning to be a hub of the AgCross database. Has anybody heard of that? Sort of a, sort of a new thing. Um, and that is basically connecting um, you know, the Long-Term Agricultural Research Network, LTAR, which maybe more people have heard of. Uh, there's, there's all these like data gathering efforts, but they all have sort of different goals. And, and we figured rather than trying to put everything in one place, it's like, let's just make it so it all connects. So we've um, uh, been working with people at the Soil Health Institute to, because a lot of our participating sites have like, they gave some data to them, so they gave it to us. And then we're also connecting with this GL10 network, which is based in the UK, but, and is more focused on European and um, like African long-term studies, but we're um, trying to plug into all these existing resources so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So I just wanna go a little bit into the process of building the drives database. So the first step is we met individually with every site over Zoom, because that's the area we live in and just um, you know, tried to do our homework, collecting information, um, establishing agreements, because you know you gotta make sure you're not stepping on anyone's toes, agreeing when to publish, et cetera. And then they get their data as neat and tidy as they can, and they give it to us. And so the first year, um, it's mainly just getting the details of the experiments, crop yields, weather data, and then now we're working on gathering additional management data, such as planting and harvest dates, soils data. Um, so this process is a lot easier for some sites than others. If they've already participated in a data network, then it's like, oh yeah, we put it all together in the, this data entry template, I'll just send you that. And it's, it's great, it's well-documented. At other sites, it's like, oh, um, I think there's a hard drive somewhere that has the, 2010 data, and I think a graduate student took it 10 years ago. I, I think I still have their email. So it's it's very varied, but they've done an amazing job at getting us what they can. And there's some stuff, especially with these long-term experiments, that if it's not there, it doesn't exist anymore, which is sad. Um, and then of course, what I do is I take their beautifully packaged data and I stick it through my meat grinder and just uh, do some quality control. So uh, two strategies that I highly recommend for data quality control are making a template. So basically I know what data is supposed to be there and then I can see what data is there and then what's supposed to fit in there and doesn't. And I've actually found quite a few like, you know, oh, I marked the wrong plots that year. It's like mistakes that the sites didn't catch. And then of course, just the simple thing of graphing it. You know, it's like, oh, why is this alfalfa yield a thousand times higher than the other ones? Oh, it looks like they added an extra digit. Like, you know, a lot of stuff that's hard to, that's easy to catch, but hard to catch. And then of course, configuring it for the drives database, which uh, I just a trigger warning, I'm going to show a diagram that's really complicated. Okay, there it is. Um, <laughs> I'm not gonna explain this whole diagram, but I just wanted to show Here's the database schema. Uh, and each of these represents a different table. 
right now I actually have, um, I say database because it is, but it's not in like, you know, SQL or a database management system right now because that's harder with, I, I don't, won't get into like what, when that's a good workflow and when it isn't, but for expedience sake, right now I have everything in a set of Google Sheets and build in some of these interdependencies with data validation and so forth. And, um, you know, everything with a color is, explains something that's referred to in another table. But anyway, um, separate information, separate tables. So, uh, and I don't show here, there's, we also have an extensive data dictionary and um, workflow stuff. So just a lot of things. Um, I just wanted to share a few design principles that have been really helpful for this challenge of putting all these experiments with different designs together and dealing with changes in experimental design over time because somebody comes in and they're like, why are we looking at continuous corn? We should be looking at like corn mung bean. It's like, okay, let's get rid of the continuous corn. And actually I shouldn't say that nobody gets rid of continuous corn, but you know what I mean? Um, so here's an example of, so one is, is uh, the concept of vertical design. So this is an example of horizontal design. So let's say I wanna say what experimental treatments were applied to each plot. So I have like when that happened and then I have like a column for each different kind of treatment. And so as you add more sites, you have to add more columns because you know other sites might have like a manure versus no manure, or they might have like, you know, we played music to it or we didn't play music to it. Like that, you know, you want to account for everything. And so the more sites you have, the more cumbersome your table gets. Uh, but with vertical design, you don't necessarily have to plan ahead of time. You just have, you know, whatever the treatment type is, whatever the treatment level is, and then you know, if there's different timings for different treatments, I can, you know, I'm not constrained. So um, I kind of apply that where possible just for the maximum flexibility. Um, another strategy I really like is this concept of the database view. I just, raise your hand if you've, if you've heard of that. It's, it's something I learned about fairly recently and a concept I'm applying fairly loosely. But the analogy I think about is your database is kind of like your pantry. It's where you store your data, you label all your ingredients, your packaging has all your nutritional information, like you know what goes into it. And then you have some kind of recipe, let's say um, a script where you merge things together, you filter out the data you don't want, you do calculations, et cetera. And then what you're left with is you know, the actual pie and what you're actually using, but you're not really, you know, like you, to actually do your analysis, you end up with usually some kind of monster table that just has everything. Um, in a real database, what they do is this table shows up, but there's no data actually stored there. It's sort of just a way of looking at the outcome of a set of merge functions and filters and blah, 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 um, which I don't do that the proper way, but I have like, okay, here's my database, here's my script, here's my data view, which I'm gonna save somewhere else, use this for the analysis. But if I'm gonna share my data with, with anybody, you know, the database is the way to go. It's so much easier to have all your documentation, quality control. And then this is kind of like a temporary object that's just sort of used. Um, and of course, through this whole process, uh, I use scripts for everything, mostly R, a little bit of Python. Um, but the advantage of that is we can you know, do collaborative coding with our GitHub repository. And if I need to go back and change something, I can you know, make a little edit to the script and just run it again. Um, but of course, you know, it's really hard to manage data for a multi-year experiment and, you know, funding cycles are short, people leave, people die. Um, and then what you're left with is a lot of stuff. So I, I want to shift gears a little bit and, uh, I shouldn't check my watch because it's wrong, but um, okay. Talk a little bit about some strategy and lessons for data management. Um, so here's kind of the ideal workflow. It's what we say we do in our papers. We design our experiment, we collect our data, process it, we analyze it, we publish it, and then we, you know, pop a champagne and and you know, this whole process results in a bunch of stuff, which I consider all of this to be data, right? So when you design your experiment, you're gonna write up a set of protocols that you're gonna use in the field or in the lab or what have you. You have 
know, your raw primary data and whatever files you use to, to process it. And then you have you know, your edited data that you, you analyze and maybe a whole bunch of different files that go into your manuscript. And, and we all are accustomed to keeping track of all these different things. Um, and it's hard enough in this idealized form, but in the real world, you know, let's say in a multi-year experiment, you might have the first year where you're doing all the things. And then in year two, you're still collecting more data from year one. And meanwhile, you've had to, you've done some preliminary analysis and revised your protocols. And you have more data and you have more edited data and the different stages of development. And then you go another year and you're still processing data from year one and two. And maybe you've got a different set of protocols and you know, you've, you can't, ideally you wanna do the same thing every year, but you know, by year four, your funding's running out. And so you've got to, you know, apply for another grant and you're still catching up on old projects and and time goes by and and people leave and maybe someday in the future you or not you or maybe uh now it's future you who forgot about past you whoever it is they're stuck with this mess that you or or past you or the version of past you made and you're like like what do i do um so basically it's kind of like it's kind of like being fit the solutions are simple. We all know what to do, but it's hard to do it in the moment. So uh, a good analogy of fitness is that the best exercise is whatever you're able to do consistently. So uh, you have to design a system that's easy enough to stick with in the hardest of times, but also you, know, you, you have to account for those unknown unknowns. So you have to have enough flexibility to accommodate change. So I think the best the most important data management habit is to document as you go. I call this the memento principle. Anyone seen that, that movie? It's a, a guy who has short-term memory loss and can't remember, has to like write all these cryptic messages for himself so he remembers who out, who's out to get him and who's not, and it's very suspenseful. Um, but there's a lot of uh, strategies for documentation that kind of allow for real life. So. I'm a fan of the stream of consciousness research log. Um, I have oh, it's not in my pocket, is it? Um, having note-taking software on your phone where you have like the date and you can use like your phone's voice transcription software. So if you're just too tired to write, you can at least get something. Um, make Every time I make a table or a file, I make something that explains what it is. For the drive stuff, I have like one central, you know, table dictionary and column dictionary. But when it's, you know, more in the early stages of a research project, I might just make like, you know, a tab or another file that's like, okay, here's what all these column means. Or if I make really descriptive file names and column names, I don't have to do as much documentation. Um, photos are also a really good strategy. They're time stamped, um, especially if you have some way of backing them up. And I've actually known people who uh, use Twitter as a uh, research documentation tool, just like take a picture, we went out and surveyed plot 30 today and it's on the internet, it's timestamped, it's organized. I mean, Twitter owns it, but it's a very boring Twitter profile. But other than that, I think it's a good strategy. Um, another system I like thinking of is the touch it once principle, which I learned from my grandmother. But it's kind of like, uh, you know, when I come in the door, I use my keys, I step in the door, I put my keys on the hook. If I put my keys down and then to put it on the hook, I need to touch it again. It's prob I'm probably just not gonna be able to find them later. Um, so basically setting up your system to minimize the number of steps you need to you know, make your documentation useful or have your files accessible by other people. And a lot of this these days is technical solutions. Um, I'm sure plenty of you have strategies you use. Um, and finally, a strategy that uh, I found really useful, I credit to Brian Carlson, who's a data manager for the LTAR network but it's this concept of uh, data zones. And I mean this sort of in an abstract sense, like the zone is uh, partially a location, but it could also be a way you name things. But the, um, basically your raw zone is everything primary. So you know, obviously your raw data, the protocols that apply to that data. I also consider correspondence. Um, I really like saving emails as PDFs in with whatever thing they apply to. Um, any field notes. And then your working zone is a little bit more amorphous. It's anything that's in progress, you know, intermediate data sets. And then once you get to the point of, say, submitting a manuscript, you've got your production zone, which is like whatever final 
super, super final, I really mean it this time, dot, you know, <laughs> CSV file, that's your final edited data set. You have whatever files are like what you submitted to the journal. And usually like, you know, while you're working on things, that's whatever's the most recent iteration. Uh, so the main thing that's really important uh, for the sake of your documentation is once you're finished, nobody cares about this, that's for you. What's really important is being able to trace this path between the raw and production, because uh, that's what transparent reproducible research is all about. So um, when I'm you know, making documentation, I really focus my effort, um, especially in the raw data, that's you know, the stuff as you go, um, in the production data. If I've got really good documentation in my raw data, it makes that step a lot easier. Um, so in that sense, it's like having a clear version of what every file is, um, using stable file formats. So um, text-based files like CSVs, um, PDFs, or you know, things that aren't going to be corrupted by some software change. Um, and you know, every file is essential, organized. But then in your working zone, you know, you have enough have to have enough documentation so you know what's going on, and you're going to have stuff at different stages. Uh, one version control technique I find really easy to do and useful is putting the date and file name. Specifically with this format, it sorts just, everybody should just be in the habit of writing their dates with that order. Um, that's my soapbox. And then, um, you know, it's uh, stuff that's expendable, but, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to keep everything separate, but the idea is if I want to be able to look back and what I did. It's like, okay, I know I know where I started, I know where I'm ending up, and then um, everything in the middle is going to be messy, and that's okay. So that's actually uh, all I or where I can end. Um, but I want to thank uh, my colleagues who helped me prepare for today, and Lori for suggesting that I do this, and the seminar organizers, and the people in Zoom who have been being so patient. Thank you. I'm going to open up to any any questions or, you know, if you want to share uh, the technique that's worked for you or a challenge in data management, I think we've got time. Yes. So uh, once you have all the data organized in your database, what kind of analytical tools do you foresee using to be a pretty huge data set? I mean, basically, uh, yeah, so our analysis is... Uh, well, it's funny because it seems like a huge data set, but in the um, world of data science, it's actually a pretty small data set, right? Because, um, you know, people who do like bioinformatics or, you know, marketing research, they're dealing with like gigabytes of data. This is like maybe the whole thing might be one gig. Um, but we use, um, so we're using Bayesian models in R primarily. So I've spent the whole of, the last like two months making a uh, very complex data view for, we have two um, sets of models, one for looking at focal crops and effects of diversity and one for looking at rotation level. And both of those have different criteria for what data should be included and excluded. And for the rotation level, you've got to um, impute some missing phases or be able to see what's missing. So that's actually really the hardest part. And then, but then once we have the data set, it's like, okay, let's, uh, we've got, the um, both the berms and the rethinking package in R, we've got some uh, some Bayesian models kind of set up. They take a really long time to run, um, so we use um, and you could do it on your personal computer. I often use the uh, the USDA supercomputer just because it's faster and less likely to crash. Um, but it's you know fairly manageable once you get it all together. Mm -hmm. Question about the horizontal versus vertical. I forget what the exact term is. Oh, yeah. Is. Um, I kind of made it up, but I think it's a thing. Uh, all right. And so my question is with the horizontal design, um, for me, that's that's what I uh, intuitively use. And for that, it's very easy to just like feed that into R. And then it's like each column is a thing that you can test. Whereas with the vertical design, that seems like that would be a bit harder to do. How have you worked with? Oh, yeah. That's a good question, actually. So this comes back to the issue of your data storage versus your data view. So like, this is the easiest way to build and add data. But when I'm actually analyzing it, I turn it back to horizontal, right? I use um, 
usually like the reshape function. I know there's tidyverse things, but I kind of uh, am new to tidyverse. Um, so what I end up with in my really extensive data view is like a gazillion columns with each possible treatment type across all of everything. And so it's like, it's fairly easy to go back and forth between these things. But um, when you're collecting and storing data, um, having the vertical design has some advantages. But yeah, most of the sites, since they just have like, you know, let's say if they just have a tillage and a fertility treatment, like it makes sense for them to have those columns. But for our purposes, it's like, well, some people have a tillage treatment and some people, you know, have much more creative treatment. So yeah, it's uh, helpful. Mm -hmm. How are you working statistically around the holes in the long-term data sets? Yes. Um, so the first step I have on my computer, I have like a gazillion thoughts about this. This has been like, I'm glad you asked that because that's been like my life for like the past two months. Um, the, it depends on how big the hole is. Um, so it's set, setting some criteria, like, um, so uh, one is in the experimental design, is every phase of rotation there every year in theory? So like there's some uh, rotations that we just had to take out because it's like they just had two entry phases of a six year rotation. And so for the rotation level yield, you need to have the same crops there every year or else that number is gonna mean something different. Oh, I should also say, uh, I bury the lead there, we're uh, converting it to yield dollars using uh, national agricultural statistics price data, which I don't think is gonna be that different than the raw yields, but it's, it's a big selling point. But anyway, so gaps. Um, so one solution is to just take out the whole thing, if it's big enough. Another solution is, um, so within that experimental design, are there other replicates of that same treatment phase that are there? Like, is it just one plot that got missed, for example? And if that's the case, I'll take the average from the corresponding replicates and fill it in for that missing one. But then if the whole thing is missing, it's, uh, you know, how much of the, is it the whole rotation? Is it like, you know, how much the rotation is it? And uh, what I usually do is, um, you kind of have to go site by site to see what's suitable. But for most of them, I would use a, um, a GAM, you know, some sort of smoothing function of that specific crop and treatment over time, and then see like, okay, does that seem like a suitable you know, estimate? And the reason I do that in the rotation level and not in the yield level is, you know, let's say you've got five different crops, but you're just missing one of them in like you know, three years, um, and it might be a different one. Um, so that missing one, you just want to put a plausible value as a placeholder, but the other four crops are really going to provide informative data and you don't want to lose that. And especially with a lot of these, if we just took out all the years with, with a missing phase, we wouldn't have much left. So yeah, a combination of just going site by site and imputing things. I also have, have a lot of things I, originally I was like, I'm going to talk about all the annoying Excel things that people send me that people sh shouldn't do. And I was like, that'll be too pedantic, but, but I could get into some of that. Excellent. Yeah. So um, a big part of it is uh, thinking about what a, what a computer can understand and what a person can understand. So I've gotten data sets where, um, you know, they use colors to indicate these are the years where there was something wrong. And, uh, or like they have, you know, notes that are, they've used some kind of special formatting. And like when you're a person looking at it, like, oh, that's great. I can see that, that, and that. But when you're trying to put it into a computer, just I have to just code all that and it's really annoying. So um, part of, you know, the touch at once principle saving time is trying to collect your data to the extent you can in a way that a computer can understand so you can automate things. So a computer understands uh, strings. Uh, well, there's the type of data, so you know, character, numeric, um, and then of course the subcategories of numeric, like integer, um, you know, boolean. What? Oh yeah, oh yeah, logical. I think those are the three main things: are, are character, numeric, and logical. And then dates are kind of their own thing. Um, if you have them as much as in the character 
category as you can, you'll be better off. Um, so kind of trying to keep things in those four categories. Um, so for example, um, having just one type of data per column. So something I see really commonly is like, there'll be like, okay, here's the yield. And then when there was missing, they'll just say like, oh, missing this year in the same column. And then, you know, sometimes they might have like a dot. Um, so when that's read into a computer, it's just interpreting everything as a character string, but I really want it to be a number. So um, it's like, if I have notes, make sure that's in a different column. It's all character stuff. Um, yeah, thing, things like really simple things like that. Oh, and not hiding any information that's useful in Excel formulas. Um, so I've had um, a real doozy of a time figuring out unit conversions for bushels to basically you know, the volume based things to weight based things. Um, bushels per acre are just like the bane of my existence because every crop has a different conversion between bushels and yield. And it depends what their standard moisture level is, which can kind of vary from place to place, even though everybody says, oh yeah, it's standard moisture. Like, well, yeah, but over there it's 12 and over here it's 14. Like, um, I know it doesn't make that much of a difference, but um, I figured out a lot of these things. Like I was only able to figure it out because it was hidden in some Excel formula somewhere. And, uh, you know, it's, um, so having uh, any calculations be transparent. So if there's a column that's calculated from other columns, having those other columns there, um, even if it seems really, even if it's the same thing in every column, because at least that's, you know, transparent documentation. Although I, I prefer to do any kind of, you know, calculation of one thing from other things in a script rather than in a, Excel sheet. There's although there's also this tool called um, Open Refine, which uh, is a good intermediate for between for people who want to have like a reproducible data cleaning but don't want to learn scripting. Um, it's completely open access. It's a more of an interface kind of like Excel, um, but then it saves everything you do in like this thing or like a um, a set of steps in the background. And if you want to do the same thing again, you can just run all those steps. So um, it's like a little bit of a probably less of a learning curve than you know use learning R, but uh, it's a good um, option. Let's see, I'm trying to think of other things. Oh, um, th thinking about how to how to design to translate between machines and humans. So um, sometimes you need to design for humans. Like I had to enter all this information from a map image, and it was. The best way to do it was just to make a data sheet that was shaped like the map. And, you know, maybe even going out in the field, it's like you have, you know, something that's organized in a way that's least error prone and easy to do. But then, you know, I have a set of rows and columns. Computers are good at positions. You know, if you have a matrix, you can have rows and columns. Or if you have a set of tables, it's like, you know, if, as long as you know it's the same position, then I can relate that to another thing and put it into, you know, a nice neat table. But if I'm trying to use that nice neat, nice, neat table when I'm entering information, I'm going to be like, okay, where's plot 101? And oh, shoot, that was plot 110. And there's more mistakes to be made. So uh, yeah, I've been wants to, you know, look at some fun stuff. I'm always happy to do that. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.